Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the latest trends in enterprise tech? Look no further than the Breaking Analysis podcast with Dave Vellante. This data-driven program dives into the most important topics facing the enterprise tech industry today. With a data-first approach that leverages ETR's renowned surveys of IT decision makers and insight from the Cube community, Breaking Analysis delivers in-depth research on the most important topics facing technologists and IT buyers. Whether you're a business leader, an IT professional, investor, or just an avid follower of the industry, this podcast is a must-listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast wherever you get your podcast and tune in today to stay ahead of the game in enterprise tech. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hope everybody's doing well. We continue to move through May of 2023, kind of getting into the later part of the month. It's uh, unbelievable. It's all, almost half the year is, is, is gone by. I mean, not, not completely. You know, we're not through June yet, but uh, getting pretty close to halfway through 2023. Hard to believe uh, things are moving so fast, but uh, hope everybody's doing well. Another Sunday Perspective show. And I want to kind of go through... What feels a little bit like uh, what, I'll, what I'm calling kind of a cloud trough of disillusionment. Um, so a few months back, I think maybe back in February or so, uh, I did a show, a Sunny Perspective show, on what felt a little bit like we were seeing a backlash of a lot of sort of anti-cloud uh, discussions. You know, people saying, well, don't use the cloud or, you know, repatriation, whatever it might be. And it feels like over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've seen a couple of incidents popping a lot uh, whether it's, you know, the, the recent cloud earnings, uh, you know, the, the cloud providers starting to slow down their earnings, um, you know, not necessarily slowing down in the sense of like, you know, negative growth, but uh, the numbers aren't necessarily there. Um, you know, and then we start to see, you know, various types of, you know, one off incidents in which, uh, you know, people start to question, you know, whether or not uh, the things that have built some of the the modern principles, the modern trends are a good idea, right? So recently we saw an article that came out from uh, Amazon Prime Video. The internal engineering team talked about, you know, how they uh, had originally built it on on serverless and it wasn't able to scale. And so they sort of moved back to more of a kind of a more monolithic type of architecture. And it's interesting because I think what we're seeing is <clears throat> what is really pretty normal, but what feels a little bit like maybe confusing if you've been, you know, kind of around this cloud native space for the last decade or so. And what I mean by that was, you know, there's really kind of four or five main principles that this sort of modern cloud native uh, movement has been built on, right? The first one is cloud's going to be the dominant place to run applications. Uh, we're starting to see people talk about, well, you know, is that still the case? Um, public cloud would be cheaper to build and operate than uh, do it yourself, than what you do on premises or anything along those lines. Uh, the third is, you know, you should just be able to use open source software. Just use what the community provides for you. There's lots of good uh, available technologies there. Uh, the fourth was that, uh, you know, most or all modern applications will be built on, on microservices and most companies will uh, go through the efforts to modernize existing applications into microservices. And then finally, uh, the sort of idea that, uh, you know, while public cloud would be the dominant place, multi-cloud would not be a real thing. And I think we've seen over the last few weeks, few months, uh, maybe it's a maybe it's sort of coming down off of COVID, uh, but it, what feels like sort of a lot of questioning of some of those principles. And what I want to try and do after the break is dive into: Are we really seeing people questioning those principles as if maybe they're not a good thing, or are we just starting to see a few anecdotes that kind of make, you know, make some data points? Maybe not make a case, but make some data points for some reevaluation of those core principles and whether or not they're a good thing or not. So I want to dive into that, plus a few more things right after the break. Are you getting pressure from finance to justify or reduce your cloud bill? CloudZero is the only cloud cost platform loved by engineers and trusted by finance. CloudZero can identify unused, idle, or over-provisioned resources, alert you to spend anomalies, and organize 100% of your spend into a framework that mirrors your business structure, like cost per customer, product feature, or team. It's the most powerful platform ever built to provide accurate, granular visibility into your total cloud spend without the typical pitfalls of legacy cloud cost management tools like endless tagging or clunky Kubernetes support. Manage cost, optimize development, and maximize profit all in one platform. 
Join companies like Rapid7, Drift, and SeatGeek by visiting cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started. That's cloudzero.com slash cloudcast. Visit today to experience immediate and ongoing savings on your cloud bill. And we're back. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, I want to dive into what feels a little bit like, uh, you know, if you, if you look at it from from afar, uh, if you look at some of the headlines that are popping up, what might feel a little bit like a kind of a cloud native uh, trough of disillusionment, right? People are starting to question whether or not microservices are still a valid uh, architectural uh, principle, or whether it's a good idea to build applications in a distributed way, uh, whether or not um, the cloud, the public cloud is still a viable place for, uh, you know, a, a vast majority of applications. Um, we're starting to see people uh, question whether or not, you know, the open source communities can deliver things that are viable or whether or not uh, vendors are needed and so forth. And so, you know, we're starting to see some things that, you know, are really kind of the the core foundation of what's become this cloud native movement over the last five to 10 years, um, you know, and for various reasons, people are starting to question it. So I want to kind of go through a couple of things as to why this feels like a, an interesting time. Um, you know, and we, we try not to do too much on the show that is, you know, not sort of evergreen, you know, where you could tune into this a year from now and be like, oh, okay, it still made sense. But sometimes, you know, you, you do sort of find some point in time, some points in time when you kind of go, okay, is this a trend? Are these just some random occurrences? Uh, is this something we should pay attention to? And it feels like we're at a little bit of a crossroads. And what I mean by that is, you know, we just, uh, you know, we're, we're finally, for example, we just uh, finished KubeCon EU over in Amsterdam. Uh, great event. Uh, great job by the CNCF. Uh, 10,000 people in attendance, which is, I think, the largest they've ever had for a CNCF event. Really kind of, um, you know, gets back to the pre-COVID sort of 2019. I think it was uh, KubeCon San Diego was roughly the same size. Um, KubeCon uh, Chicago, which is going to be in November of 2023, is expected to be bigger, closer to like 12,000 or something like that. So on one hand, you've got a community of people who <clears throat> you know, are, are kind of coming back from COVID, coming back from uh, events being small or canceled or postponed, uh, kind of coming back in in droves, uh, which is a good thing. It's a healthy thing, healthy thing, healthy, healthy, healthy. It's a healthy thing for the community. And um, but on the other hand, you know, you're starting to see various types of articles pop out and various sort of trends that make you question. Oh, okay. Well, maybe maybe this isn't necessarily as big a thing as it as it could be. And I think the reality of it is we are starting to see some backlash to the idea that, you know, one, one technology modernization, one technology trend, one technology architecture will be the sort of one size fits all. And, you know, what's interesting about this is, is if you've been around the industry for a long time, this shouldn't come as any sort of surprise to you. We have yet to really ever see any technology become a one size fits all, a silver bullet, right? What we've always seen is that technologies tend to build upon the other one, um, and they don't tend to replace the other one, right? So other than like smartphones replacing sort of the, you know, what Steve Jobs considered the not smartphone, right? So the, the Apples and the Googles of the world replacing the, the Nokias and the Blackberries of the world, but they didn't really replace the idea of a mobile phone. But, you know, in general, from an IT perspective, what we tend to do is we just kind of stack things on top of each other right? The mainframe hasn't gone away. There are still plenty of, you know, PC client server applications written in Windows. There's still tons of, you know, LAMP stack applications out there. Um, you know, there's there's now a burgeoning, you know, growth of Kubernetes usage. Um, there are, you know, tons of container usages out there, but they haven't replaced the other one, right? There's still tons and tons of VMs out there, you know, running legacy three-tier applications that, you know, help run the business. And so I think what we're really going through is what feels a little bit like, you know, some people pushing back on and looking for examples of, uh, you know, some some things in which, you know, maybe microservices weren't a good fit for you. Um, maybe, you know, this realization of like, yes, distributed microservice applications are going to be more complicated, uh, at least for some number of people, than previous types of applications had been, right? And, you know, that's okay. Um, you know, it's every trend that we go through is some sort of trade-off. There's never sort of a, a perfect 
it just makes everything better. Um, you know, so in the case of microservices, do they potentially make things easier for developers because they can build faster and not have to be dependent on, you know, a huge monolithic code base? Yes, absolutely. Do they make them, does it make operating the application more difficult for the platform engineering team or the DevOps team? Yes, absolutely. Because you now have to deal with, you know, network latency that you didn't have to deal with. You have to deal with identity and trust and encryption that you didn't have to deal with before. You have to deal with things like Kubernetes or service mesh or distributed identity or all sorts of other things that you didn't necessarily have to deal with before. So we're seeing some of that. <clears throat> the other thing we're starting to see, though, is I think certain things that were sort of promised to us haven't necessarily materialized. So, for example, um, lots and lots of talk. And, you know, if you're paying attention to the show, uh, you know, we, we've had a number of, of great sponsors of the show, um, you know, Cloud Zero these days, who you know, are focused on cloud cost management, cloud cost optimization, right? Uh, we've had, you know, Matt Ray on recently from Cube Cost and, and lots of other things. And what's interesting about that is there's now this sort of cottage industry that's uh, burgeoned up, you know, kind of come up around cloud cost management, whether it's, you know, Kubernetes specific or across, you know, reserved instances or any sort of type of thing. And what's interesting about that was when AWS was first sort of staking its claim as the cloud, one of its, you know, two claims was number one, um, we are cheaper than running things in your own data center. And, you know, to a certain extent, when you were starting to price things, uh, you know, in cents per hour, it looked extremely inexpensive. And depending on how you priced it out or how long you ran the application for or whatever, it could be very much cost effective. But the other thing that they were adamant about doing all the time was saying, we are going to continue to lower costs, right? And one of the things that was adamant in all of their keynotes every year was look at how many price drops we've had. Oh, this is the 47th price drop we've had. This is the 63rd price drop we've had. You no longer hear about that anymore. You no longer, you know, the, the cloud providers are no longer sort of looking out for passing along the savings that comes from, you know, them doing this consolidated buying of compute storage and networking resources and passing along those savings to you, right? They've become, uh, you know, you, the end user. They've become such important revenue streams for Amazon, for Microsoft, for Google, uh, and profitability centers that that's not being passed along. And so they've essentially, you know, kind of given up that part of the equation and they've now pushed it off back to the customer to say, well, you should not only have to figure out these new tools and technologies to do it, but it's on you. It's on you to, to manage the cost. And in fact, we're seeing articles, you know, talking about, hey, Cloud cost management is not a fad. It just needs to become part of the discipline of what you do, right? It should become, you know, part of your good hygiene for what we do. So again, is that a, a terrible thing against sort of the principles of cloud native? Uh, maybe, maybe not, right? The economics aren't really necessarily built into the architecture of cloud native, but it is interesting to see how that has shifted as well, right? We don't <clears throat> necessarily expect the cloud providers to be looking out for our best interest in terms of, you know, trying to reduce cost of running. They're really looking for you to just run more in the cloud. And what's been interesting, the flip side of that is, you know, we are seeing the cloud providers as a whole, uh, their revenues are starting to slow down as a whole, right? Um, you know, they're not growing at 80% year over year, 60% year over year, but again, they're at much bigger numbers, right? We're looking at you know, 100 to 120 billion dollars a year annual run rates, 100 maybe 150 billion dollar run rate. So, you know, that piece of it's, you know, kind of going through a a, a reckoning, uh, a reevaluation, a rationalizing of, you know, what should I expect the cost to do this um, look like? Because again, we didn't necessarily see that as a thing in IT years and years ago, and then the cloud kind of came along and said, hey, we're going to make this better for you. And, and that promise has sort of fallen away to a certain extent. Um, the third thing that we're seeing, which is sort of interesting, and again, we're seeing this partially as we talked about with layoffs, you know, have happened somewhat in our industry, right? Um, haven't been massive, massive. Obviously, we never like to talk about layoffs as, as not being a big impact because everybody's job is important. But it was in the 5 to 10% range, um, and a lot of it was – kind of a, again, a rationalizing of this massive buildup that happened during COVID. 
Um, but what we do continue to see is we do continue to see companies, uh, end user companies, not investing in training their own people, in not investing in um, the skill sets needed to help to grow people, you know, to, to train people up on new stuff. So they want the benefits of new technologies. They're not necessarily willing to train people. They're willing to push them off to a whole plethora of you know free online training that's available. And we, we do see people actively trying to take care of their own uh, careers and their own career paths. But that trade-off that used to sort of come from having a loyalty to your workforce, you know, loyalty to your employer is now turning into people, you know, staying for a couple of years at any given place because the the commitment is not necessarily there. The what used to be sort of an unwritten relationship between you're taking care of me, therefore I have a loyalty back to you doesn't really necessarily exist anymore. And so the flip side of what that means is whereas you know, during the last five or so years, and we talked all the time about, hey, you could just use open source software. If the skill sets aren't there, we're beginning to see, and, and there was some stuff that was like in the latest, um, you know, Kubernetes, state of State of Kubernetes 2023, 20, 20, 20, 20, I think State of Kubernetes from VMware. And again, maybe it's a little bit biased because VMware is a vendor, but seeing more and more companies who are saying things like, we are using vendored versions of open source more so than we use, you know, just the open source itself. And, you know, we've seen, I think, a lot of trends of people, you know, struggling with some of the newer technologies. And again, I think a lot of this goes back to not, are the projects good? Are they not good? Is the documentation good or not good? It's, there's just, <clears throat> you know, there's there's just not the commitment of people to, to learn the technologies, stay at the companies they're at. Um, and hence, you know, companies are struggling to, to implement things when people either leave or, you know, they were trying to do it with open source. It wasn't as easy as maybe they perceived it was going to be by itself. Uh, and now they're starting to sort of default back to, you know, starting to use some of the vendor versions of that. And it might be coming from the cloud providers, might be coming from a software provider. Um, so, you know, again, it, it's one of those sort of flips on the trend that was the core of the, you know, the kind of the cloud native movement. You could just use open source software and that people are going to figure these things out. There's been so much open source software that's come into this domain, into the, you know, I'll call it the CNCF domain. You look at the CNCF landscape, there's just so much that's come in, so many projects, so many optionalities. It's just really, really hard to keep up with any of these things, right? Um, now, the good news of this is, you know, historically, whenever we've had what felt like troughs of disillusionment, we've had economic downturns, we've had slowdowns in the economy or, you know, some things along those lines, the nature of our industry tends to be one in which, you know, companies or individuals or groups tend to be hyper competitive. They tend to be hyper curious. Um, and we tend to see great new, interesting things come out of these things. And so I would expect that to happen again, uh, over the next three, four five years, right? So as you're, if you're looking out at the sort of landscape and you're going, huh, okay, maybe some of this stuff hasn't panned out. You know, it's been good. Now it's sort of going through a lull. I think we're going to see some really new, interesting things sort of come along. And they might be more cost-effective ways to build applications. So, you know, maybe sort of serverless 2.0. It might be more cost-effective ways to do this. So, um, you know, people figuring out the best way to, you know, build a NetLafly type of stack and and see companies that are doing things along those lines. So, you know, taking the most commonly used technologies, kind of bundling the, them together, integrating them together in better, newer ways, we may begin to see that. Uh, we may begin to see sort of a, you know, a 2.0 way of thinking about stuff from the cloud providers as their revenues start to sort of slow down and they become critical, critical profit centers for their parent companies, maybe they do start to think about sort of, you know, a 2.0 iteration of, of what they've done as opposed to just being, um, you know, deliverers of individual pieces and parts, um, as as Brandon Wichard likes to say, um, you know, they start to think a little more in terms of solutions. So I think, you know, we're going to see some interesting stuff there. Um, you know, the other thing I think that we'll see is I mentioned 
you know, these technologies don't tend to replace the last ones. They tend to be adjacent to the last technology trend. Um, you know, I think we will see for people that have invested in the space, they've invested their time, their effort, their passion, um, you know, their creativity around this cloud native space. Yes, you will see people start to peel off and go say, hey, I'm going to go focus on AI stuff. That's going to be a, obviously a, a big deal. We're starting to see a lot of trends about that. But I think for those who have been around this cloud native space for a while, uh, you know, the companies will begin to place greater value on those that have, you know, skills in this space, that have tangible experience and expertise in this space. Could be two years, three years, four years. Um, but you will see more and more companies who will, you know, value that uh, maybe more so than, you know, they were having to pay high salaries for people that had one year or six months of expertise. Um, that's going to start to rationalize itself back down again. But they will see, you know, people who, uh, you know, companies who will value, um, you know, people that have multiple years experience that are sticking with it. Um, because again, the cloud native space has been one that has shown tangible benefits, useful benefits, right? It has been able to help developers be more productive. Companies have been able to deploy uh, more frequently and be able to get new features out more frequently. They have been able to scale in ways that they couldn't do before. Uh, They have been able to scale in ways that are more cost effective than they could before. So, I mean, there are very tangible benefits that have come along with the cloud native space. Um, Yes, it is not a one size fits all a silver bullet to fix everything. And I think, you know, for those of us that have been in the industry for, you know, in this space for a while, we've always sort of known that. Um, but we do continue to see sort of progress, even on the things that are the hardest things, right? You know, stateful applications, storage and databases with things like Kubernetes. Um, you know, we are seeing progress in those spaces. Um and, you know, we're still going to see some some examples where, you know, just like the Amazon Prime uh, example, not everything is a perfect fit for what they have to do. It might not be the right skill set. It might not be the right technology. It might not be the right price point. And that's OK. Right. It, it's perfectly fine for people to realize that, like, hey, not every problem needs to be solved with the latest and greatest technology. It just might not be the right fit. Just like, you know, there's a reason that the automotive industry has electric cars and non-electric cars, and it has sedans and it has pickup trucks and it has sports cars because not every use case or not every desire uh, is going to fit, you know, those types of things. So, uh, you know, I I think as, as I, like I said at the beginning, you know, we're at a little bit of an interesting crossroads. Um, There are going to be people on sort of both sides of, are we, are we at a trough of disillusionment for the cloud native space? You know, are things, as good as we thought? Are they potentially not as dynamic or good as we thought? Um, I think there's evidence on both sides that uh, not only has cloud native been relatively successful and has, you know, opened up some new opportunities and brought new productivities and new cost savings to the space, but, you know, there are also, you know, shortcomings that have not yet been resolved and may not be resolved, right? We may not uh, you know, we may realize that, hey, uh, in order for developers to be more productive, um, it is going to be harder on platform engineering teams. It is going to be harder on the groups that that have to operate this. And we're going to have to figure out some ways in which, um, you know, they won't get burned out as quickly. Uh, but I think, you know, every technology trend has a certain amount of trade-offs. Um, you know, we're seeing that again on the AI side of things. People are already asking, will this displace jobs? And Will this make you more productive, but also potentially displace your job? Like there's always going to be those trade-offs. So anyways, um, you know, I think it's fair to to be, you know, questioning some of the things that that are coming up. Uh, I think maybe we've been a little blind and not always questioning those things over the last four or five years. I think it's fair to be questioning them. But I think at the same time, um, you know, I think there's also plenty of anecdotal evidence that uh, it continues to be, you know, a space that may not be growing as rapidly as it was before, but it's still growing at a very healthy rate uh, and in very large numbers in some cases. Um, you know, it continues to to look for ways to solve problems as opposed to just creating net new technologies. But, uh, you know, it's perfectly fair if people are starting to question it. Um, usually when they start questioning it, uh, we have gotten to a point where 
the use cases are valid, at least a subset of the use cases are valid, and some use, some, some use cases are not going to be valid, and people should be questioning whether those are the right things or not. So anyways, uh, interesting time, interesting sort of crossroads. It will be interesting to see you know, a year from now what the cloud native space looks like. We'll be seeing more prime video examples out there. Will we see the growth of public cloud sort of be taking off? Will we see, you know, the continued trend of people using more vendored open source? Who knows? We'll see. Uh, but anyways, I thought it would be an interesting time to sort of explore that. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to dig into today. So hope everybody's doing well. I uh, hope everybody's, uh, you know, getting into into the springtime, summertime, uh, able to do some things. Uh, I know I'm traveling a little bit, so that's been nice to get out and see people again. Anyways, with that, I'm going to kind of wrap it up. Thank you all for listening. As always, thank you for uh, being a great, great community, uh, helping us grow the show. Uh, continuing to see uh, growth of the show uh, month over month. So we very much thank you for that. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for helping us uh, grow the community. Um, Thanks for listening every week. We appreciate it. And with that, I'll wrap it up. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 